a cold dose of reality from the experts, and equities appear to pay attention. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Welcome back. Joining us this week, Larry Summers of Harvard, Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. The old idea of a commuter going into New York City five days a week may be an idea that's behind us. Energy Secretary Dan Briette. What the president has referred to as a V-shaped recovery looks very clear in the charts right now. Wall Street veteran Steve Ratner. I am pretty pessimistic about our ability to get back to that point uh, at any time in the immediate or uh, imaginable future. And Afsani Beshlos of Rock Creek Group. The experts spoke this week, and for once, investors seemed to take heed. Dr. Anthony Fauci warned that opening the economy too soon could lead not only to illness and even death, but it also it could do more harm than good for the economy. And President Trump, he would have none of it. Look, he wants to play all sides of the equation. Uh, I think we're going to have a tremendous fourth quarter. And then Fed Chair Jay Powell warned of potential mass bankruptcies and unemployment. He said that we may need more fiscal and monetary stimulus. And once again, President Trump, he disagreed. I disagree with him on one thing now, and that's uh, negative rates. But Wall Street heavyweights like Stan Druckenmiller and David Tepper sided with the experts, saying the talk of a V-shaped recovery was really just a fantasy, and that equities are more overvalued than at any time since 1999. It was a week of cheerleading from the administration, even as those on the front lines, from governors to investors, talked of caution and of worry. And one of those who's been expressing caution and even worry has been our very own Wall Street Week contributor, Larry Summers. From the very beginning, he's been talking about some of the problems we have in store. This is some of what he said in the past on this program. The first plank in that uh, right economic strategy is an aggressive health strategy. I think the market's reflecting a sense that there's a wall of money. Okay, and we're delighted to have with us now Wall Street Week contributor from Harvard, former Treasury Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers. So, Larry, give us a sense, why is it so difficult for us as a people to really follow the science, follow the facts? Because it seems like the more we see it, the less we pay attention. I wish I knew and I wish I fully uh, understood. We're not getting presidential leadership that's emphasizing what the scientific community uh, mostly believes. We all want to believe that problems aren't there and that we can go out uh, with uh, equanimity. So there's always a desire to grab on to uh, good news. And we're not being given a solid plan beyond uh, grabbing at flailing attempts that could possibly uh, work. The reality is that viruses like this uh, go into remission, just like cases of cancer do, but there's always a very great risk that they'll come back, and you have to manage that risk uh, very aggressively if you want to succeed. And my great threat, is fear, is that we're not managing that risk uh, aggressively. We're letting everything back into the open before any of the criteria that experts have laid out have been fully uh, met. And we may not pay for it, but I think the best guess has to be that whether it's soon in the next couple of months or whether it's uh, deferred towards fall and winter, we will pay a price for that in more cases, more fear and apprehension, ultimately less economy, uh, more job loss, more uh, reductions uh, in income. So I'm not very comfortable with the path uh, that we're on, which uh, seems to me to be translating hope 
uh, into a strategy. I could conceivably turn out to be wrong, but it's not a prudent bet uh, that we're making. It's not a prudent bet that so many people are not wearing masks. It's not a prudent bet that we're engaged in so little testing and so little contact tracing. It's not a prudent bet that we haven't made more substantial efforts to separate and target aging and vulnerable uh, populations. Our strategy seems to be we're just tired of this and we're going to let it all go. And it might work, but it's yeah. not something I think we can count on. Well, Larry, as you say, you may be wrong, and we hope you're wrong, but thus far you've been pretty close to right in all of your caution. Look out now over the next month or two months, what might be maybe on the radar screen, but not in the center of it, that you think may well end up in the center of it? I think there's a risk that there are going to be big increases in the number of cases in at least some of the places that have opened up, and that we're going to have more hot spots that may not be as bad as New York, but are going to be in the direction of what happened in New York, and that that's going to uh, freak people out. I think there's a risk uh, that the law is going to let up, but people are going to realize that they're actually uh, pretty scared to go to stores, and they're pretty scared to sit in restaurants, and people are going to realize that life's going to be more or less like this, until we have a vaccine, and that that's going to be a while, and that that's going to lead to some reassessment that there's more uncertainty and lower incomes ahead, mm -hmm. and that that's hardly going to be a positive uh, factor mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for markets. I think there's a risk that we're going to understand that there's much more financial strain ahead as people can t start running out of the short cash reserves they had and not paying rent, not making uh, mortgage payments, not making uh, credit card payments. And I think there's an associated risk that lending is going to decline and that that's going to create something of an adverse uh, financial uh, spiral. I think there's a risk that and Larry, people- Larry, if I could just interrupt on that point, on that point specifically, we heard from I'm sorry, we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell this week saying, if this goes on very long, it's going to be trouble. And then at the very end of the week, the Fed itself came out and warned about potentially significant asset price declines if, in fact, this pandemic lasts too much longer, if this crisis lasts too much longer. At the same time, we have a debate between the Democrats and the Republicans, by and large, in Congress about how fast we need to have the next relief package. How much time do we have? Every week, we delay committing to supporting the incomes of unemployed Americans, supporting new investments in testing, in contact uh, tracing, in addressing this virus. Every week we delay supporting state and local governments is a week that we are weakening the foundation of the economy, prolonging uh, the downturn, reducing the speed of uh, the upturn. We should be making the necessary commitment to keep supporting uh, the economy within the next two weeks, and it looks less likely now that we're going to do it. Does Nancy Pelosi have exactly the right formula? I think she's got many of the right elements, uh, health investment, state and local government, unemployment insurance uh, in particular, but we need uh, to be getting uh, somewhere, and uh, I hope that we can find, in the face of this most extraordinary of emergencies, some capacity for bipartisan cooperation. Is the best way to help the workers uh, directly to the workers, or does it go through the states, through block grants, or, or to the companies? I think, we, I think we need to have generous unemployment insurance, and we need, it needs to be there for gig workers. It needs to be there whether your job ends. It needs to be there whether you're on temporary layoff. Whatever exactly the circumstances, if people have lost their ability to work, we need to be supporting their incomes and those of their families. 
we've got municipalities who do vital work. They fight the fires. They uh, keep the streets uh, safe. They will have to educate the children, perhaps in uh, new ways, uh, given uh, this challenge. This is no time for them to be cutting their budgets because of balanced budget amendments and reduced uh, tax collections. This is no time for hospitals to be closing. This is no time for doctors and nurses to be furloughed. And if we're going to avoid that, we need to uh, be supporting state and local governments. And we need to get off of defense. We need to start playing offense and start using a moment when commodities are cheap, when there's all kinds of unemployed people to do the work, whether it's renewing the country's uh, infrastructure, whether it's building a caring economy, to do the work that's always been essential um, for us as a uh, country. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. There's a lot of work to be done, not to speak of infrastructure, which is something you've talked about uh, on more than one occasion, Larry. Renew the infrastructure, and that's what we need to be moving forward with, uh, not debating about having a state bankruptcy code, which is the proposal that Senator McConnell put forth uh, some time ago. Okay, thank you so much, Larry. It's always a great treat to have you with us. That's Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, now at Harvard. And he also is, by the way, uh, an important contributor to Wall Street Week. Coming up, we hear from a frontline governor, Ned Lamont of Connecticut, who's trying to get his state running again, but has no illusions that things will look the same. Our anticipation is we're gonna ho open on a statewide basis uh, on a very thoughtful way. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Across the country, states are trying to open back up, including some of those who have been hit the hardest. We talked with Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont about the progress of the disease in his state and what it signals for what comes next. We were hit in different ways in different regions. You know, Fairfield County, which is closest to New York City, was hit the hardest, hit the earliest went right down Metro North and I-95 up through Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford. That was the area that probably uh, got hit the hardest uh, because of the proximity to New York. And now we've got Eastern Connecticut, which is the new London area, and maybe a little bit of Boston is coming down that way as well. Uh, but we're a pretty small state, so our anticipation is we're going to open on a statewide basis uh, on a very thoughtful way. And uh, on some things, we want to do it in association with our neighboring governors. It doesn't do me any good to um, close down bars and restaurants if Andrew Cuomo opens them up in Westchester County. So we're doing some things in conjunction. Yeah, Governor, as you mentioned, there's so much integration between Connecticut and particularly New York City, the New York City area. What about those commuter trains? Will that pose a particular challenge for you? Because we have a lot of people going back and forth between Connecticut and New York every single day on those trains. Uh, there were a lot of people uh, going back and forth, uh, and we thought about that. But within a, a few weeks, ridership was down 95 percent. So I think people uh, voted with their feet, so to speak. They started staying at home, they started telecommuting, or they drove if they had to, which was a good thing. So um, Governor Quo and I thought about what we should do with, say, Metro North, the rail system, and decided it was probably first responders and people that really had no other way to get to work. So we did keep it open on a limited basis. But as you reopen, as, as we reopen, will we be looking at a certain curtailment, for example, of capacity, the, the seating arrangements, things like that, and the commuter trains? Uh, we're certainly going to be very strict about um, uh, desanitizing and making sure everything is clean on a real basis. Probably going to discourage people from going in the train for the near term. Uh, probably we're going to uh, strongly recommend that everybody use masks in the train for the near term. But I think even bigger, I think you're going to find that... Um, the, the old idea of a commuter going into New York City five days a week may be an idea that's behind us. I think we found at the end of this uh, COVID uh, session um, that we're realizing that telecommuting in many cases works. So maybe you have a great job that seems to be a geographically located in New York City. You can do it two-thirds of the time from your home in Stanford. 
As you look toward a possible reopening, uh, uh, what is your situation with respect to testing, with respect to tracing and hospital capacity? You said you have the hospital capacity you need right now, but in case there's a flare up, how much capacity do you have to deal with it? Well, we have 40% capacity now, and um, I think uh, that, that's a pretty good benchmark. If there's a flare up, I would rethink things if we got to 80 or 90% capacity. Obviously, we have capacity now. In fact, they're going back and doing some of the uh, so called electives, many of which were important operations that were put off and should be uh, taking place now. The testing, um, we've ramped that up. We're doubled it from last week, we'll double it again next week. So we'll be doing about 42,000 tests a week uh, starting next week. Uh, Governor, give us a sense of what the fiscal effect has been thus far on the state of Connecticut. We certainly hear a lot from governors, Republican and Democrat, I will say, that they really need some help from the federal government. We have a Democratic proposal now out of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. What are Connecticut's needs? Well, it's tough. I think we're in um, relatively good shape compared to our peers, but that's not uh, a great metric. Um, you know, we are a big manufacturing state. We never closed down manufacturing. We're doing a lot of construction. That's ramping up. We had a $2.5 billion rainy day fund, which for a small state like us is, um, you know, close to 15% of our budget. So I think we're relatively okay for now. But um, let's face it, if I've got a billion dollar deficit in this fiscal year, 90% of it is related to the fact that we um, are losing income tax and sales tax, it's related to the fact that the revenues have just uh, collapsed at this point. And that's very pronounced in all my neighboring states as well. So I do, do think that the uh, federal government should step in with some support because this is no time to have the state governments uh, slashing spending and raising taxes. That's a lousy alternative. What we've heard from Republicans, uh, and I wonder if you don't think they have at least something of a point, is there's a difference among the states. Some have been more prudent, some have been less prudent, and it's not quite proper to bail out the people who are having problems in part because they've put too much, for example, up in pensions. Are you sympathetic at all to that, an that argument? Every state, blue and red, has been impacted in one way or another by this COVID crisis, directly or indirectly. So I wouldn't turn this into a political thing. I'd try and figure out what is the policy that helps these states get back on our feet and the economy get back on its feet. It's the states getting back on their feet, but it's also particular households getting back on their feet. And, and I was struck, as I think others were today, by Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony, in which he said 40 percent of households making less than $40,000 a year are now out of work. What's the situation in Connecticut? What do we need to go, do going forward once we get past the next two, three, six months? What do we need for those people going forward? Yeah, well, I found in Connecticut that um, we kept... Um, businesses that represent over 70 percent of our GDP operating, as mentioned, manufacturing, finance, for example, but um, the service sector, uh, restaurants, bars, salons, that's where a lot of the employment is. Those folks earning $40,000 a year left, that was hit hard. That's where 50 percent of our unemployment is. They represent 15 percent of the GDP, 50 percent of the unemployment. So. We're cautiously trying to get them back to work. And in the meantime, we help them get um, access to PPP loans, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And the Connecticut did pretty well there, but that's a short-term bridge. That was Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont. Coming up, restaurant chains are struggling with how to reopen across the entire country in a wide range of circumstances. The CEO who oversees restaurants like Burger King and Popeyes this week laid out his plans and how things will look different going forward. The business has shifted uh, to off-premise, and we, can, we think it'll be that way for, uh, for the foreseeable future. I think we, we think that the business, in many cases, will, will change forever. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Restaurant Brands International runs some 15,000 restaurants nationwide, including Tim Hortons and Burger King and Popeyes. And throughout the crisis, it's been serving customers on a takeout basis. But this week, it announced plans to reopen its restaurants for some in-store dining, albeit under very different circumstances. Its CEO, Jose Sill, has no illusions that things will look the same. We've seen a tremendous shift uh, into off-premise, obviously, and, and we've been investing in technology uh, in, uh, in our company at, at Restaurant Brands 
and the three brands that we own, Burger King, Popeyes, and Tim Hortons. We've been investing in, in our technology team with engineers and, and, and digital folks as well for, for quite some time. Uh, and it's been a, a, very, a very important investment as we see today how, how the business has shifted uh, to off-premise. And we, can, we think it'll be that way for, uh, for the foreseeable future. I think we, we think that the business in many cases will, will change forever. Uh, Jose, to what extent does your business now depend on things like uh, Uber Eats and Grubhub? By the way, Dow Jones is reporting that maybe uh, Grubhub and uh, Uber Eats are in, Uber are in the process of negotiating perhaps a merger. How does that affect your business? So we, we've been rolling out uh, delivery in, in North America for quite some time, and, and we've accelerated that, that rollout with, uh, especially in, in Canada, uh, with thousands of restaurants uh, onboarding uh, the, the different aggregators that we ha that are available in Canada. In the U.S., we have many restaurants uh, with Burger King and Popeyes and Tim Hortons using uh, multiple aggregators, uh, third-party uh, delivery companies, uh, Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, uh, as well as Postmates. And we also have, uh, we've enabled uh, over the last, uh, since the end of, uh, of, of 2019, we've enabled what we call our white label for um, delivery on our own app, uh, which is increasingly growing uh, as, a, as an important part of, uh, of our delivery business. So we, we, we've been working with many of them and, and all of the, the key providers, and, uh, and we think that having access uh, to delivery through the multiple aggregators and, and as well as our own native apps uh, will give consumers and guests opportunities to enjoy our great products uh, and, and beverages from our great brands uh, any way they want, at any time that they want it. Jose, we hear a lot about supply chain right now, particularly when it comes to meat. Should we be worried about whether there's going to be meat available from your stores on, for example, July, July 4? No, we, we have a, an amazing uh, group of, uh, of suppliers uh, that we've been working with for, for decades uh, at Burger King, uh, and, so, and, and, and the same for Tim Hortons and Popeyes uh, for, for all the proteins that we, uh, that we serve. Uh, we've got uh, safety measures in place for, for stock and inventory. Uh, we work very closely all the way back to, um, to the raw material suppliers, and, and we're working closely with them uh, during this difficult moment. And, uh, and we feel confident in our supply chain. We feel confident in the quality of our product and in our ability to deliver it uh, every day to our consumers across the country and across North America. Well, say so you have a presence in China. Talk to us about what you've learned from the experience in China. And for that matter, are you thinking about maybe expanding, uh, expanding over there? Luckin is having some difficulty in coffee. Are you going to open a bunch of Tim Hortons coffee shops? Yeah, we've been in, in China for quite some time. We, we have over 1,300 restaurants with Burger King. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we started to develop Tim Hortons in China uh, in 2019 and, uh, and, and had a, a very strong start uh, last year and, and look forward to a, a really fast uh, growth trajectory in, uh, in China for the coffee business, which is, we think, one of the, the more exciting markets for coffee uh, around the world, uh, in addition to the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and then Popeye's uh, is, uh, is about to open its first restaurant in China uh, in the coming days, uh, you know, by the end of the week or early next week. It's a beautiful store in, uh, in Shanghai. So we, we believe uh, long term in, in, the, in that market. We think it's, a, it's an incredible market uh, where, where fast food and, and quick service brands like ours uh, in, in, spa in a space, in a segment uh, like burgers, chicken, and coffee that are fast growing in that market will do quite well over time. That was Jose Sills, CEO of Restaurant Brands International. Coming up, looking for green shoots. Could the auto industry point the way toward a rebound? We talk with Wall Street veteran and architect of the auto industry recovery, Steve Ratner. I think we have to be careful not to be misled by uh, early signs of what may seem like spring. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Cars are making a comeback. Low gas prices and the need for socially distant modes of travel are bringing back demand for cars and even for trucks. The truck segment has stayed surprisingly resilient through the whole crisis. And on top of that, our new product portfolio has done exceptionally well. And within that, we've gained shares. The auto industry is starting to recover from the initial shocks of the coronavirus outbreak. We see an automotive recovery that is underway and sales have, have developed from 50% down to 20% down by the end of April going uh, into May. Low gas prices have done their part to help consumers. Consumers all over the world are benefiting. Fundamentally, that is an opportunity for households, 
This is something that is going to help our friends, the American middle class. And the low prices could stick around for a while. Our base case, this market trades a $30 a barrel Brent basis throughout third quarter. One of the biggest advocates for mass adoption of electric vehicles thinks that they will come out on top, even with low oil prices. The most important variable there is the trade-in value for cars. Tesla's trade-in values, its residual values, are holding up much better than the residual values or the trade-in values for cars. Traditional automakers are also embracing the electric trend. We are marching ahead in our plans with uh, EVs and AVs. We're committed to an all-electric future. Whether driven by electricity or internal combustion engines, automobiles are an important part of the U.S. and global economy, and they may be showing some slight signs of a rebound. Steve Ratner is a veteran of Wall Street who also headed up President Obama's efforts to save the auto industry. And we asked him whether he could see some indications of a rebound overall in the economy from what we're seeing from automobiles. I think we have to be careful not to be misled by uh, early signs of what may seem like spring. We are going to see, and there's already a little bit, a tiny little bit of evidence of a pickup in car sales from an, obviously an abysmally low level in the month of, uh, month of April. But this is, this is all going to be relatively small potatoes uh, compared to the distance we have to go to get back to where we were before all this started. And I am pretty pessimistic about our ability to get back to that point. Uh, at any time in the immediate or uh, imaginable future. Well, we heard some of the pessimism, or at least realism perhaps, from the Fed chair, Jay Powell, yesterday in his remarks where he really warned about things like mass bankruptcy and unemployment if we don't do even more in the financial, the fiscal and the monetary side. Uh, is there more that can and should be done to try to bring that recovery sooner? Yes, absolutely. I, I am completely in agreement with uh, Chairman Powell, not that he needs uh, my support for his, for his thoughts. Uh, look, as I said, I think, I think the notion that we are facing a V-shaped recovery where it's all going to bounce back, car sales are going to go back to 17 million, people are going to travel and spend and go to Disney World and all those kinds of things is, is frankly a fantasy. Uh, this has been an enormous shock to the economic system. There's been much permanent job loss, factories that are never going to reopen, restaurants that are never going to reopen, companies that are never going to rehire back, or at least not in the foreseeable future, all the people that they have laid off. And so we do need to do more. But I think it needs to be not just providing income support to Americans who've lost their jobs and to uh, businesses that are in danger of failing, but also, we need to really rebuild America. We need to finally do something on infrastructure. We need to do something about retraining and finding jobs for the people who are not going back to their old jobs because this whole economy is going to shift into a somewhat different uh, focus. And so, yeah, there's an enormous amount Congress can do. The question is whether they have the will to do it. In the meantime, we have uh, big investors trying to decide what to do. We heard Stanley Druckenmiller and Lantepri yesterday saying they're very concerned about the equity markets being overly optimistic about the future. As an investor, what do you do in that environment where equities actually have bounced back a long way from the trough, frankly, and they may not be justified by the economic data? I think many of us have been scratching our heads about the resurgence of the equity market, and we can debate the reasons for it. Uh, I think the, the, the most important reason is probably all the liquidity the Fed has pumped into the system. But nonetheless, uh, I think what Stanley Druckenmiller and David Tepper and others have been saying makes a lot of sense in terms of being concerned about the level of the equity market. How do you hedge it? Well, the simplest thing to do is simply sell. Uh, there are then, if you, if you, for whatever reason, want something more esoteric, you can do things with options. You can do things with tail risk. There are more sophisticated ways but at the bottom line is either if you don't have a positive view about the equity market, you simply need to reduce your exposure to the equity market, give up the possible upside, and protect yourself against the downside. We still are in a world of quite efficient markets, and there are no silver bullets or magic ways to, to take out the downside but keep the upside. I don't think any of us feel that uh, corporate credit, corporate bonds, things like that are particularly attractive at these levels either. And so I think uh, the best advice I would give would be a, a mix of some equity exposure so that if, in fact, it turns out these levels of the stock market make some sense, you can participate in it 
with good companies, uh, combined with maintaining a very low leverage, low level of leverage, if any at all, and a high, and a high amount of a cash balance on which you should not expect to earn any interest, but you're not going to lose any money. And what about cross-border exposure? There's a lot of talk now that uh, supply chains may never be the same. Certainly, there's a lot of focus on China right now, with the president really uh, certainly rattling a saber about China. Does that indicate that you're better off with more domestic exposure and not as exposed to globalization? We have to see how that unfolds. Uh, there's certainly a lot of talk by the president, but frankly, with the president, it's mostly talk. There's some talk among CEOs, and that we should pay close attention to. I think we've all learned a lesson here about long supply chains. But as we look around the world as investors, we find Europe exceedingly uninteresting. Uh, they have huge structural problems. Their companies are not the companies that are most likely to do well in a post-COVID environment. They have a lot of old economy industrial companies. Uh, China has done and is continuing to do amazingly well both in terms of uh, keeping the virus under control, but in getting people back to work and in, uh, and in getting their economy going again. And the, the biggest risk in China is the one that you identified, which is essentially will they have customers, either because the economies uh, elsewhere are not in great shape or because the supply lines are too long. We'll have to see how that unfolds. But we have been before all this and continue to be as an economic matter, not as a political matter, not as a, uh, any other matter of that sort, but as a purely economic matter, we continue to find China very interesting as investors and, and uh, are disproportionately invested there. Is the big issue right now for the United States and maybe for the globe demand? I mean, we hear about things like demand destruction or, or a doom loop. Uh, is that what uh, you believe Chairman Powell was talking about when he said there could be really long-term, maybe even permanent damage to the economy? Are we in danger of permanently destroying demand? I think we have a problem on both the supply and the demand side. We clearly have a problem on the demand side when you have what is effectively, when you make the right adjustments and things, probably 25 percent of Americans out of work getting their unemployment insurance but not their, their real wages and with huge uncertainty since the unemployment insurance does uh, expire the extra $600 after eight weeks, obviously people are going to spend less. And of course, when they're essentially trapped in their houses, they're going to spend less. And you see that in the consumer spending data. But we also have a problem on the other side, which is that we are seeing uh, factories closing for good. When I talk to CEOs, they tell me almost universally, we are not going to bring back everybody that uh, used to work here. We're not sure we will have the demand for that. We're cutting our CapEx budgets to be more in line with what we think the economy is going to do in the future. That obviously has negative reverberations through the economy when capital expenditures are cut. And so I don't think we're in a doom loop where we're going to go into some kind of depression. But I think, I think the climb out of this is going to be much slower, much more difficult than people might have thought even a few weeks ago, and maybe some people even think today. That was Steve Ratner, chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors, which invests the private and philanthropic funds of Michael R. Bloomberg, the founder and owner of our parent company. Coming up, oil has added to the concern over the economy overall. We talk with Dan Briette, secretary of the Department of Energy, about the prospects for oil. Third and fourth quarters in 20, and certainly into 21, are going to be very, very robust. So the production will come back online as this economy begins to take off. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Oil has been one of the darkest corners of a gloomy economic picture. But with Saudi Arabia this week announcing unilateral production cuts, things may be looking up. That's what Secretary of Energy Dan Briette says, and he thinks it applies to both the supply and the demand side. Yes, it is starting to look really good. As the president tweeted out, and as he's, he's been saying for quite some time now, uh, we're on the verge of a transition to greatness, and we're starting to see it. We now have 23 states that are opening opening up. Uh, there are local economies that represents roughly 40 percent of the gasoline demand in the United States. We're starting to see oil prices stabilize. I think it's very important to note that um, you know this increase is good for consumers in the sense that jobs are protected all across the economy. And uh, we've seen no dramatic impact on gasoline prices across the country, which I think is very important as well. 
Is there any risk that actually the U.S. production may come back too far too fast? I mean, I, I just read there's Energy Transfer LP came out and said that at least in the Permian Basin, that actually shale's coming back quite fast. That went down about 8% and now a full quarter of that is back online. Are you at all concerned that that might undermine some of the efforts here to stabilize the oil price? No, I don't think so, David. I think what we're going to see here very shortly, if, uh, if you're familiar with our Energy Information Administration, what we refer to as EIA, uh, they just put out a report that talks about the uh, economic boom that I think we're just on the verge of seeing. So the third and fourth quarters in 20 and certainly into 21 are going to be very, very robust. So the production will come back online as this economy begins to take off. And if you look at those numbers, I think you'll see the, the, that uh, that – and what, what the president has referred to as a V-shaped recovery looks very clear in the charts right now. So you'll see the production tend to match that V-shaped curve. So, Mr. Secretary, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about what kinds of accommodations you needed to make. The president designated you, along with Secretary Mnuchin, to really help out the U.S. oil industry. And you were talking about certain things like lending facilities. We also have the Fed now doing that as well, changing their rules. Do we need that support anymore, or is that taken care of pretty much? Well, it's a little early to tell, and it, you know, it varies company by company, but what the Secretary directed uh, both Secretary Mnuchin and myself to do was to evaluate the programs that were passed by the Congress and ensure that there is access for these energy industries to those programs. And that's what we've done. Secretary Mnuchin uh, worked very closely with the Federal Reserve. Uh, we adjusted the program, the Main Street Lending Program, and uh, made that program available to what we refer to as mid-cap size com uh, companies. You know, there are companies in America that are investment grade. Um, they perhaps do not need the same level of economic help that others do in the marketplace, and they have access to capital and access to liquidity perhaps others don't have. But there are many companies out there that simply didn't have that option. So making available this program uh, that was passed by Congress was very, very important. And I, I applaud Secretary Mnuchin, the Federal Reserve, and others uh, for moving so aggressively to do exactly that. So, Mr. Secretary, when you implement a program like that, how do you deal with what a lot of people call moral hazard? As you said, the investor-grade companies don't really need it so much. Others do because they're not in nearly as good shape. But sometimes that's because they've, let's be frank, borrowed too much. This tends to be a bit of a boom and bust business, as I understand it, in the oil patch. How do you make sure that we're not encouraging uh, almost reckless behavior when it comes to financing? That's absolutely correct, David. I mean, there's no question that moral hazard exists. It exists in every form of the banking industry. So, you know, when we apply these types of, um, you know, or we create these types of programs, we apply very strict lending standards to them. And what Secretary Mnuchin and I did was to ident identify those companies that really were impacted by COVID. I mean, it, but for the COVID pandemic, they would be strong, ongoing concerns. And we looked at those companies for potentially um, making loans available to them. We did, you know, we're very, very clear and very strict about this. There are some companies that were on the verge of insolvency, and they were highly leveraged and were perhaps not going to make it under any circumstance. Those companies are going to be excluded from these types of programs, and I think rightfully so. That was Secretary of Energy Dan Briette. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our Wall Street Week contributor, Afsani Veshlos, CEO of Rock Creek Group. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It was a week of the experts, including Jay Powell, the Fed chair, warning us that we are not out of the woods yet. And if we had any doubt, at the very, very end of the week, the Federal Reserve came out with their official semi-annual report saying if the pandemic takes a turn for the worse or it goes on too long, it could have a substantial hit on asset prices. We welcome now our Wall Street Week contributor, and she is Afsani Beshlis, the CEO of Rock Creek Group. So Afsani, when we talk about assets, we tend to focus on equities. They get a lot of attention, but we've got credit and debt markets as well. Where are we on things like high yield? Nice to be with you today, David. Interestingly, high yield has been following credit, uh, the equity markets um, since the crisis. And in fact, high yield uh, spreads came in to about 760 basis points, and high yield is up about 4.5% for the last quarter and another 70 basis points uh, in the last month, which is not what you would expect with the kind of economic news that we're seeing. 
Uh, the, the Fed is warning us about the possibility of really some asset price diminishment. At the same time, are they contributing to part of the asset prices that are there now with their essentially blank check on the liquidity front? You're absolutely right. The the two trillion liquidity uh, the, uh, package that came in uh, through the Fed mainly has created this enormous liquidity. But as we're seeing, as the crisis is going on for longer period and may go on beyond the potential opening of various states, what you would expect is that many companies are going to start having solvency problems. And just like with oil prices that were low, people did not start driving. Uh, if interest rates are incredibly low or maybe in, even in the negative range, as the future markets are showing, they might be, we're not going to be bar borrowing more necessarily. And if we want to, banks may not be lending to us. So that push has not necessarily turned into creating demand for goods and services. And so therefore, I think what the Fed is trying to encourage everyone to do is maybe for the government to start looking at fiscal policy. Afsani, as an investor, uh, what are the assets you're looking at that may be a little bit more protected? One of the things you've talked about before on this program is ESG, and various people are saying ESG is actually holding up better than one might have thought. You're absolutely right. With ESG, uh, what we found is that some of the um, stocks that we had invested in were actually outperforming regular markets, the, uh, the total S&P, by more than 5%. Uh, over this period, which is quite a large amount of alpha. We also saw that even the ETFs were showing that uh, in Europe, for example, they were outperforming the general index. And in the US, the ETF that is sort of an ESG ETF was outperforming around 2%, which is also quite significant during this period. The other thing I'd say is that we also saw inflows of assets into ESG, even ETFs, um, not just private funds, which has been more the dominant form of um, investment in ESG. I suppose, Afsane, the question is why? Why do companies that pay more attention to environmental, social, and governance, why would they do better in this particular crisis? The main reason is that you have the environment, but then you also have the S, which stands for social. So those companies have been taking care of their people more and better, which means that you don't have the problems you've seen, let's say, in the meatpacking industry, where people got sick and died, and that impacted the whole industry. Uh, if you are taking care of your staff, if you are taking care of your teams and making sure they're, help uh, they're healthy, they're well paid, it also means that they will be able to work even during these difficult times and they will be more productive. So I think that's one reason. The other thing, of course, is that many of these ESG funds were not investing in oil and gas. But the interesting thing is that it's not just a negative uh, part of this, which is not having invested in oil and gas. It's actually what they have invested in, which is health sector, telemedicine, education, as well as uh, clean energy that has been benefiting uh, from uh, during this period. I've said another thing you have a lot of experiences in is in emerging markets. Uh, yeah. What's going on in emerging markets? As I understand it, there's some divergence there about uh, among the different kinds of emerging markets. Huge divergence, uh, David. In terms of the uh, emerging markets, uh, it is it, is, it now means something very different. Basically, almost 80 percent of the emerging market index now is Asia. If you look at North Asia and South Asia and Southeast Asia, that is 80% of the index. Even 10 years ago, it was only 55% of the index. More importantly, what we're looking at right now is that uh, within uh, EM, for example, China was um, down only 5% when overall emerging markets was down 18% and, and overall US markets were down, depending on what index you look at, 12 to 14% over the last uh, few months. Similarly, the, um, the China equivalent to the NASDAQ is actually up 18%, which is quite significant. So what you're seeing is not only divergence between countries, while Brazil and Russia were down 28% during this period, um, China was down only 5%, um, Korea and Taiwan were down somewhat, but the point is that you have divergence among countries and then you have divergence among the sectors. Um, and uh, the other thing I think worth thinking about in emerging markets is whether India will be the next China. 
Well, take us through that. That's quite a notion. If India is next China, how would that work? Basically, uh, Prime Minister Modi has come out recently with a huge package, which is responsible for about 10 percent of the GDP, equivalent to 10 percent of their GDP, uh, which is uh, significant. That also, like our package, is mainly uh, concentrated on monetary policy and directed towards the uh, poor segment of the population and the middle classes trying to get sort of bread on the table and some basic services um, to low-income families. But also, he has started, uh, seems to be more seriously working on laws and regulations, which, as you know, have been uh, deterrents to uh, investors coming in or in large investments being made in uh, India. On just in the last uh, two weeks, there were a huge amount of investments being made by Facebook and Vista and Silver Lake, for example, Enjoy, uh, which is a, a techn technology platform uh, which is expanding very rapidly in India. Similarly, we saw the news about Apple talking about moving up to 30 percent of their production cap uh, capacity into India from China. The companies, as they start tiptoeing into India, trying to see what their experience is, if they do have good experience, I wouldn't be surprised if they push for some level of um, supply chain diversification starts with a larger country like India. At the same time, is India more vulnerable at the moment to the, the virus itself? China is somewhat ahead. Where is India? Absolutely. India, India had one of the most significant lockdowns. And uh, despite that, Mumbai is still one of the highest uh, levels of death and sickness as we speak. So, so while they have locked down, you know, it's very hard if uh, a large share of your population is living in slums or in a very difficult situation to have social distancing. Similarly, they don't have access to ICUs for those kinds of populations, which has been a big problem in India in terms of inequality of access to health uh, system. But I think that is the negative part of India, which uh, to what some extent uh, Prime Minister Modi has been trying to address. And uh, the other side of it is the very strong technology bent, the very strong uh, technology right. within health sector. And then, as right. you know, um, they always right. wear ahead in, uh, in terms of um, right. bringing their technology to the U.S. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Thank you so much to our Wall Street Week contributor from Rutgers Group, Afsani Beshlas. Always great to have you with Afsani. Thank you so much. So that does it for this edition of Wall Street Week, a very eventful week, if I may say so myself. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg, and we will see you next week.